Andale, welcome to Mint. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me, Adam Levy. <laughs> Thank you for Is being it Levy on. or Levy? Is it it's Levy? Levy? It's Levy. Everybody gets okay, like good. confused because my, my thing on Twitter, my handle is like Levy Chain. But some people yeah. call me Levi. Some people call me Levy. Some people call me Levy. Call me whatever you want. But it's Levy for the record. Uh, well, welcome, you, welcome to the podcast, man. I know you have your own podcast, and maybe it may be unfamiliar to be on the other side <laughs> of the stage being interviewed. But I wanted to have you on, okay? One because mm -hmm. you're a fantastic creator yourself. Two, you're dabbling more and more into the world of social tokens, and I think you're actually getting super creative with how you're approaching it through your podcast, which I think a lot of other creators can learn. But before we get into that, who are you? What should we know about you? And more specifically, what were you doing before dabbling in the world of crypto? <laughs> Firstly, I regret this, uh, this uh, uh, interview happening um, at this time <laughs> of the night in Jasper <laughs> because I have amazing natural light during the day. Uh, so where I'm sitting, like I'd be bathed in gorgeous light. Dude, you uh, look but golden. No, you're good. You're uh, good. <laughs> I'm ruining your flow. Um, but but no, seriously, um, to your question, I'm, I'm being extra and, va and vain. Um, what did I do before crypto? Who am I? So I am the last born of three boys. Uh, I was born in Zimbabwe in the southern uh, part of Africa. And I, I think the reason I mentioned that is because I suppose it's un it seems unlikely that I might I would later become one of the more pro prominent voices in African tech. Uh, no small thanks to a little podcast called African Tech Roundup, which I started on my living room couch with a friend. And uh, prior to that, I mean, I, I studied business school. I studied for a business degree. Um, shotgun to the back of my head. My dad forced me to do it, and I'm I'm really grateful at this point that he kind of parent pressured me into into studying business uh, as a major. But sneaking off to um, field trips with the media students at at uh, at Varsity is actually nice. what got me into broadcasting. Quite literally, a, a trip to the um the the SABC which is the South African Broadcasting Corporation um changed my life i i got the opportunity to spend some a few a few minutes on radio sort of um you know doing links with a dj uh and i knew what i kind of felt i needed to do for the rest of my life so i spent the rest of the the field trip getting lost in the building quote unquote um and by the end of that trip i had five phone numbers which i called all of them agents all five of them told me to get lost except for the last one the receptionist felt sorry for me and said you know you sound like you've got a little talent you know you might be good for some voiceovers or whatever let me the you know there's a the two agents have just left this agency to start their own maybe they'll 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 mm. see you so this is like circa 2003 and um breaking into mainstream uh media wasn't something you could just walk off the street and do you kind of had to come through sort of university radio or community radio or some kind of sort of formal training you know intern someplace and then get sure. into so in any case um they they said they'd see me if i did a demo which i had to spend the next month waiting tables to afford to make because that's what it it cost i mean there weren't these usb mics like these and like you couldn't just you know you know, do a demo. So, in any case, um, three weeks after finally getting the the gig um, to see this agent, um, they landed me my first voiceover for Coca Cola. Ooh, um, and not a not a bad placement. Not a bad placement. So, so I mean, by the time I finished university, I was probably in my second or third year of a four year degree. By the time I finished university, I had a little portfolio of work and. Um, and of course, so I launched into the world as a professional, you know, do, doing work that was in line with my degree. But as soon as I could, I basically bolted for a broadcasting career, at least the, the kind that I could sort of um, latch on to. And, and, and so one thing led to another. Um, I had more experience as a broadcaster and TV, like TV personality, radio person, voiceover artist. Um, eventually writer, producer um, in, in mainstream television and radio. Right. 
Um, and, and when that career stalled, suddenly I had this amazing gig in television here in South Africa that just disappeared after four years. And, you know, I didn't see it coming. I didn't own the property. Nothing really came next in a way that you, I thought would, because I felt like this big deal. I was this producer host, um, but nothing really did. And that's when I picked up a podcast mic, um, and started, you know, trying to piece together my, my dignity. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and at the time, I mean, podcasting felt like a joke. It was like, this is what you do when you you fall off and you're desperate to keep being a broadcaster. That's what it felt like. Uh, and so um, this is around 2009. And I know America kind of took to podcasting a lot sooner, but right. in on the continent and most parts of the world, 2009, nothing was on. Um, podcasting was not a thing. If you were not a broadcaster linked to some kind of network or, or, or major sort of radio station or something, like you, you had don't no. call yourself a broadcaster. But I yeah. insisted. Like on my Twitter bio, I was a broadcaster and I was broadcasting these podcasts, <laughs> these storytelling things that these that no one would listen to. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd spent inordinate amounts of time and money like putting them together. And f- fun fact, and now I'm really digressing, but fun fact, go. those, those the, the very first few podcasts I made, which was like the series, which was so uh, originally dubbed Andile's take, right? Because everyone's waiting to, know, to get my take on things, right? So anyway, I, you know, I, 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 I did this podcast series and at least two or three of them I'm, I'm quite proud of. You know, I, I feel like, They'd stand up with some, you know, some stuff on NPR and stuff. Um, but I did them at a time no one, literally no one was listening. Five years later, a producer at the BBC would 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 hear them and go, we have to work with that guy, which is how mm. I ended up working at the BBC and has uh, on on basically their biggest storytelling program globally with like a, an audience of 71 million people around the world. So... Yeah, so it's been a ride. Um, so long, st- long story short, in between all of that, I've been like a, 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 a consultant, uh, a media consultant. I, I consult on, on media strategy and, and content plays. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got a fairly uh, impressive list of corporate and high net worth individuals I've consulted to over the years, Airbnb, The Caring Group, um, a number of different, you know, um, a number of different organizations international and on the continent and so so these consulting gigs stitched together make for a career um and yeah so the african tech roundup turned into this thing um that actually properly internationalized me because yeah no one was covering tech the way i was doing at the time and yeah it got me spending three months out of the last four or five years away from home all over Europe uh, and other parts of the world, basically repping the ecosystem for a world that typically has all these oversimplifications um, embedded in their thinking about, you know, what the African opportunity is, what Mm. it actually means to start up in Africa, you know, you know, are you real? (laughs) You know, is the hype real? Is, is there anything worth investing in? And, and so, yeah, the last year or two has been a testament to the fact that, yes, there is there is a lot going here. And it's definitely, um, there's a lot of hype, but there's also a lot of, uh, a lot of things worth investigating and investing in. So that, I, I don't know, is it the most... And here we are this, today, yes. <laughs> and here we are today. So I've given you, I don't know, a, a, a ride around my life... Um, and uh, so what were what were you covering that was so original and so unique at at ATR is it ATRU the acronym or ATR it's ATRU so for okay. African Tech Roundup um what was so unique so yeah i i coined the the phrase oversimplification is the enemy that's what I, you know and, and and largely i think that was the that was the that, that was really what we were up to. We were, there, there are a lot of na- lazy narratives about a lot of things. Um, you know, 
you know, blue is great, red is bad. Or I'm just using I'm using these flippant examples, but um, we typically, especially in the social media era, are given to binary responses to most things. You know, um, and and for most people in the world, you know, um, Silicon Valley, you know, you, progress, amazing energy, you know innovation, uh, big business, big tech, African tech. Um, you're like, is that actually a thing as you know, anything African is like suspect, problematic, uninvestable, um, uh, you know, good for foreign aid, but not for investment, you know? So th there's, there are a lot of these oversimplifications and then there are also positive oversimplifications like, yes, Africa is the future, you know, Africa rising, you know, all the, you know, the, you know, every, you know, like the macros of the African opportunity because of the population growth story and, and they're all these things. And you, you start to realize that someone has to make sense of what's, real and what's actually going on and right. and there are people who are affected by these stories in unexpected ways you know so when you tell a story that's oversimplified in the positive and it fails or it you know in a bubble burst or um because it's in account for all the complexities it actually affects the people on the ground far more than the people the, the people who sometimes mean well and tell those stories abroad to try and drum up interest in the same way, it also affects the people on the ground, the everyday African, negatively when the truth of their resilience and their innovation and, and what they bring to the world in a unique way um, is poorly positioned or sometimes completely ignored um, by a world that assumes the only way Africa can get ahead is if USAID, you know? So... So that's the value proposition. Mm. Uh, it turns out you just need to to care. You need to be blessed with an international, an international, you know, grasp of English that most people can understand. You have, you know, a talent for sense making and critical thinking and cr critical reasoning. A legit lack of fear or reverence for the status quo because I didn't come from tech, you know, so I don't know, like, it's nothing to me to like meet the CEO of some major corporation and straight up go, you know, why is your corporation bad for, <laughs> for Africa? <laughs> like, like I have nothing to lose, you know, like this is, and it turns out like, even when you come at people with that and, and they recognize your intent is genuine and you're not here to, to sort of build your own thought leadership, um, they actually find it really refreshing to have a real conversation with a human being rather than a broadcaster who's, you know, trying to project some kind of eloquence or, or grasp. And, and it, it took me probably a year and a half to figure that out because I was trying to, to demonstrate that I was as smart as the people I was interviewing. But after a while, it was like, actually, if you just, if you just be you in this context and actually serve people and actually have in mind the people who, are currently asking these questions and looking all over the internet for answers and not finding them and you're serving them, something will come you've of won. it and yeah. you've won. Yeah. And so that therein lies the long tail value of, uh, of our platform where, you know, in the year we went away for a year, it's just, you know, during the first COVID year, we, we, we took a hiatus, um, we were averaging, I don't know, three, four thousand, sometimes six thousand listens a month, without so much as a tweet or you know retweet. Organically ranking on Google, on you know, you know, for search terms like African tech, organically top one or two, three, without having to publish a single piece of content that whole year. You know, um, so that says something about not just the quality of the content or how well it meets the need, but also just how great the need is, the hunger for answers to basic questions about what's happening on the ecosystem free of the, of the special or of the sort of special interests that typically frame these, these questions or like typically just content market the heck out of, you know, their position. So 
That's that's what I think is in many words. I think African Tech Roundup did and does well is is just keep it real without trying to be like, hey, we're here to keep it real. We're like, we're just yeah, there. You know, yeah, in yeah, a way sure. that in a way that you can't just be here and do this when you're I don't know CNN. Like it's just yeah. not on brand to be that way. Yeah. So how did that kind of lead into you jumping into crypto? So I have to sort of shout out uh, the homie Andrew Berkowitz. He's a CEO of, and founder of um, a co-founder of a company called Social Stack. Right now, he and I were deep into this podcast hustle for for time. Um, so a good sort of three years. I, I maybe had a year or two on him. Maybe we started the same year or so. I can't quite remember, but. Under between the two of us, we probably had interviewed, like we'd spoken to more ecosystem players to do with African tech than pretty much anyone in the world um, at a certain point in history, and um, and so we were both determined to try and figure out a model for not just creating a sustainable lifestyle business out of our love for podcasting and the work we did in media, but you know, like why couldn't we thrive? Why couldn't we create this business? And I mean, you see things, we started to see things pop off in the US, but other parts of the world, you see Gimlet and you see all these other things and you think, um, you know, why couldn't we be that? Like, why couldn't, why couldn't we do a version of that? And, and yeah, we, we, we like, we, we were brothers in arms for the longest time. And, you know, we co-consulted together, like at some point, you know, we we had this whole plan to like merge our businesses. You know, his in DC. You know, m- you know, mine in South Africa. And then, and then, you know, COVID hit, and it got me rethinking the premise of everything I was doing as a broadcaster. And um, I was confronted with just how much stewardship is required of having this much power. And I didn't even have that much power, but it did. You know, at its peak. African Tech Roundup is like is standard fare. Um, either in the written content we put out or the podcast we put out is like standard fare for anyone within who, with an Africa focused interest in tech in the in the high in the highest echelons of power everywhere in the world. Typically, right, and so you start to you start to recognize that this comes with some serious power, and and I. And I don't think I was approaching it with the right level of stewardship mentality, which I think I've properly addressed since then um, in my own mind, but certainly even in the practice. And so between those two things, this tension of wanting to do important work as creators, we didn't even call ourselves creators then, we thought of ourselves as media makers, as podcasters. Um, But so there's this economic sustainability question uh, that that you want to that you just it it feels just unjust and and it it feels unjust and frustrating that you can put this much work and passion into work like this and and it not deliver an economic benefit that matches it um it it something just felt wrong about that on one hand and then the other hand on the other hand the ethics um or the, the the demand in terms of the ethics of of media practice are such that you know there's always this question of you know in pursuit of like the economic prosperity aspect of the work are you know to what extent are you compromising the ethics of the practice which you know I for a very long time I didn't it didn't sit well with me to be called a journalist even though that's what the PBC called me um, I think. Now, yeah. now I think I, I I embrace that somewhat. I was definitely a, a journalist, but I but it, I, it I, extends I, way way beyond that, right? It extends way yeah. way beyond journalism. Yeah, look, I mean, I think this the, the ethics aspect, like you say, it's not just a question of like journalistic ethics. I think the the question is, you know, when you have the opportunity to influence listeners and i don't mean that in a sort of flippant way like influence them to get the latest pair of jordans or whatever or buy an nft i'm talking about influence from the standpoint of you have earned their trust and they will make economic decisions business decisions 
life changing decisions like where to go to university or what to you know career choices or which country to invest in which which african country to to headquarter in and uh you know which founder to back you know um which which area in tech to 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 invest in some research mm-hmm. in and i mean these are the sort of these are the sort of decisions you know our platform was starting to influence on a regular basis based on a track record of trust and and agnostic delivery of insight um and so then it becomes how do you protect that how do you deliver on that even as you sort of figure out a way to make this a viable business which almost feels like yeah it just creates that tension and so that gets you thinking about you know the model you know how do we infuse a stewardship model that you know delivers on economic benefit but also doesn't erode the trust and the greater ethic right. of you know journalistic integrity that you want to see in great media that you want to make and these are obviously problems that have made my life that much harder because there's a version of my life that would be so much easier and so much more prosperous financially if i didn't care about any of the stuff yeah and yeah. i could just just, just jump on a mic and <laughs> do the popular thing or be popular and not care about whether or not you know this is good for the world or good for africa or whatever and but uh, I, I, you know, and I, that doesn't make me a saint. It just makes me, I think, um, idealistic and principled, which many people are. And in my position, it's like you don't squander the opportunity to to try and uh, protect something like this and and see it outlive you and your personal involvement, which is the other thing that was key to like thinking about crypto, which is, you know, what does this look like when I'm not on the mic, you know? Uh, anymore uh, or is this about me is this a like a big sort of lifestyle business at mm-hmm. some point all the podcast was about remember how I started was it was an extension of you know it was an, an accessory to a, a career that I was trying to resuscitate and in and, and an attempt to stay relevant what I stumbled upon was a responsibility to serve an audience a, a community we call the village um, a genuine opportunity to impact, you know, the trajectory of our of our continent and the role of technology in that trajectory. Um, and then you think, yeah, no, you gotta you gotta take care of this. <laughs> you gotta do that well. Yeah. And so that honestly, nothing else about crypto appealed to me. Everything mm-hmm. else screamed scam. Stay away. I'm not an early adopter for anything. Like, forget <laughs> about it. You know. I, I shouted out the homie Andrew. Like he yeah. tried. Like I, I should. I should be sitting on like a decent sort of Bitcoin stash. By he tried. <laughs> you know, he's like, bruh, Like get. You know, get get yourself like a couple of these. I'm like, nah. You know, yeah, forget this so internet it, funny money. Forget yeah. this funny money. And yeah. so, so honestly, you know, it sounds like it sounds kind of bleeding heart but it really was like if it wasn't for these greater bigger um uh i suppose matters of <laughs> i want to call it matters of the heart but uh, honestly you know philosophical moral issues around the practice of media making that i've come to love if it wasn't for those things and the tension between that and needing to basically you know pr- you know be a great husband and and, yeah. and and provide for my family and 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 not and and basically you know benefit economically and, and create a legacy if it wasn't for these greater ideas i wouldn't be in crypto today you know shout out to andrew because andrew has been a big supporter since nearly day one of mint uh through sponsorship and i genuinely love social stacks community because one, they're after like pursuing mission-driven communities, right? So there's a lot of like social token projects or coin cr- token projects in general, okay, mm. that treat their communities as pump and dumps. And one thing that's super unique about Social Stack is like embedding into their community to be mission-driven first, which is super aligned with what ATRU is doing, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I applaud the way you guys are super aligned with how you want to build community, with how you're thinking about ethics, <clears throat> excuse me, and how you guys are kind of approaching crypto as the medium to 
kind of execute on that vision. So wh when it yeah. comes to, to building social tokens, right? How do you think social tokens can kind of create new models for democratized media platforms that don't have to kind of be, uh, what's the word, you know, sucked in by corporate interest funding or sustainability? Yeah. Like, how do you kind of think about that? So I'll, ex I'll answer that question by just telling you how we transitioned. So okay. you start with this podcast that is designed literally to resuscitate a career and keep you relevant and therefore is an ex is is an extension of is is an accessory to a career right you start there and then you stumble upon the fact that oh um this is actually slightly more than that because the first phone call you get a year in is from the netherlands from mm. a company called vc for africa um that do great work uh in terms of you know um, mapping and uh well i suppose mapping and convening the the venture capital and startup community across the continent and this is a phone this is the first phone call you get from someone who says hey they listen you know they listen to your podcast would you be interested in some consulting business we're working on a MOOC you know we'd love your input on like the programming and and and, and that turns into a two-year engagement in creating a, a an online academy for 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 founders on the continent and um, you know, you're producing, you're, you know, sort of editing, you're directing on screen talent, you're presenting this content. Um, and then you suddenly realize, wait, there's a direct link between the, the work I'm doing every week in keeping people informed and sharing insights and distilling and sense making, um, and a pipeline of, of consulting business blank check consulting business because it's it's different every year every phone call you get's really different every asks different so it's not a model the model is ha is continue to invest in the in the network effect which which delivers predictably unpredictably over time right and so you make that the model and you sort of double down on that and but at the center of this whole thing is you because you can't really share it because you don't want to really share the platform you don't want to really share the glow because it really it does come down to the next phone call, which you you really do hope is your next consulting opportunity for you, right? And so then it transitions to oh well, it's a, it, it can and probably should be more than that um, because you know one you're you're, you're reaching you know, a much wider audience than you even right. expected. You're getting syndication opportunities. The BBC is calling you from time to time to do sort of features on, you know, whenever important things are happening on the continent or developments and your profile is growing, you you know, you suddenly realize that you are in the public service, right? This, you know, and now you have to right. think, well, if, you know, if the, well, the BBC thinks of me as a journalist, like I, I, let me read up on what that is. And you take some master, you know, you audit some master's classes at, at you know Wits University's journalism masters uh, at, well journalism department and you start to realize okay you know I'm cynical about a lot of the, you know this this idealism around what journalism can and should be but there's a lot in here that I probably can and should be you know adapting into my practice and so maybe I should create some kind of safeguards from from capture as it were right safeguards from myself and my personal interests and safeguards from from people who it's becoming quite apparent are quite willing to hijack the feed to to reach the audience, right? And what does hijacking the feed look like? It's like people literally want to turn you into the into the brand X African tech roundup, or you know, so they basically want to rebrand you, or they 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 want to dominate like two thirds of your feed with their content marketing or whatever, right? And and you suddenly realize, well, no, we can't have that. We're going to need to figure out how to balance the opportunity to benefit economically with, you know, the need to keep this pure. And and then the next transition is sort of like, how do you do that? Because you know, you know, ad sales can be problematic. You know, you know you know, doing the sort of sponsored content stuff is tricky. Yeah, yeah. In an ideal world, you shouldn't have to think about any of that, right? In an ideal world, you should be resourced by the people who care the most 
about the work you do and uh, who care the most about keeping it uh, free of any influences that would influence what they hear or what goes out in the world. And so, I mean, look, looking around, there aren't that many options for for um, for 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 for, uh, for mechanisms to deliver on that. And so, there, therein lies the social tokens' potential utility. It's untested to, 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 to the degree to which we envisage it being tested, but we are sure going to try to create a yeah. an economy of value. Yeah that leverages the opportunity to dem democratize who truly owns the platform, who truly determines, um, who projects via this platform into public sphere. That's how the, the social token fits into everything. And, and, and it's actually what got me in, um, you know, and it, 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 honestly, I, I probably wouldn't be in crypto at all if it wasn't for this innovation in crypto. So it, it, how many generations? It's probably like two or three generations into the crypto trend mm -hmm. that, you know, sort of birth, birth social tokenry is, is what got me. I was like, oh, this makes sense to me. Yeah. Ooh, what's up guys, Adam Levy here. Sorry for the quick pause, but I wanted to give some love to our three NFT sponsors that are making this episode a reality. They are Coinvise, Poop, and Social Stack. On Coinvise, you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Discover more by visiting coinvise.co today. Next up, we have POAP, or short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, who enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT technology, Pop facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. Collect or launch your own Poop today by visiting poap.xyz. Next up, we have Social Stack, a platform for communities, brands, and creators to build mission-driven social token economies. Offering an easy-to-use, non-custodial wallet with a suite of open-source community engagement tools, Social Stack makes it simple to bring your community into Web3 and be a part of creating an open-source, gratitude-driven future for social tokens. Create a free social token wallet, discover mission-driven social token communities, or apply to launch your own token on Social Stack by visiting socialstack.co today. All right, back to the episode. You know, a couple points, okay? So... I make it fully transparent that Mint's business model is through selling sponsorships, okay? So up and coming startups or existing companies that want to tap into like unique audiences and specifically creator-like audiences, um, they come to Mint. So the way I think about it, okay, is I issue three to five NFTs per month or per season, excuse me. And I look for partners to help support the show in an effort to promote them to the audience. And the way that kind of works is depending on the NFT they purchase determines their level of promotion for that season, okay? And I've gotten a lot, a lot of inbound requests from all these different projects. Can we sponsor? Can we sponsor? Can we sponsor? For me, I always think about what could be the best value add to my audience. So rather than thinking about it from a control point of view, right? I think about it like, okay, there's projects like Coinvise, like Poop, like Social Stack, uh, like Prime Down, like Cello. These are some of the sponsors that have been on the past, po po projects right. that have been on uh, in, in, in the past that are actually one super ethical startups. Okay. They have ethical founders, they have very transparent missions. You see their actions, they're actually committing really net positive outcomes for the space in general. What's the harm? Right. Now, if you make it apparent, if you make it transparent, you let people know that, look, they are sponsors, right? They are supporting the podcast. It's a means of keeping this thing up and running and providing content. I've learned to understand, and also, by the way, all the revenues on chain too. So if you do mintwithlevy.eth, you can see everything is transparent, clear to the point. You can see all that stuff intentionally that if there is some type of uh, on-chain play, whether it be an NFT whether it be a token, whether it be whatever it may be, we have like a track record of everything that's been happening transparently and publicly. 
So I think I think there's different ways to approach it, but I do agree with you that if it gets to the point where it's manipulative, the narrative is being controlled uh, by sponsors. Like I remember seeing this thing on TikTok, okay, mm-hmm. where in the last in the last year or so, a lot of the I don't don't quote me on the media outlet. I think it was CNBC. Don't quote me a hundred percent, but they had like a big Pfizer sponsorship. And ev- mm-hmm. after every single thing it was like this episode is brought to you by Pfizer. And after they're done interviewing. This episode was made possible by Pfizer and Pfizer just kept on popping up everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And with that came the narrative of the vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes you think actually what is happening around this, what's going on. And I don't know, these, these are just some thoughts, I guess from, from your point of view, it's like actually media in Africa is super tainted. Uh, It lacks ethics. It lacks uh, transparency and African tech roundup came into the picture to provide more of that color more of that narrative around what's actually happening and uplift the entire scene as what was happening on ground. That's, that's how I'm kind of understanding it. So I have to, you know, tip my hat off. I have to sort of uh, doff my hat to you because um, I think you have a very evolved sense of um, ethical practice in the work you do. Um, And I would say that what you just described to to a large degree is is not it is it definitely vibes with my sensibilities for how to balance the pragmatic need to uh deliver on you know building a business on media practice mm-hmm. right or a media practice based business right whether you're doing it for yourself or you're trying to build something larger than that for, 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 for like, and so there's a sense in which you've, you've, I think, so having said that, like African stories or stories about Africa fuel Mm -hmm. so many nasty agendas around the world. Mm. It is, such a lucrative business to to spin stories about Africa that ultimately are bad for Africa and Africans, and ultimately because of the size of our continent and its its outsized impact on the on the world, that are ultimately bad for the world. Mm-hmm. And so, in that context, I think there is a slightly more weighted and urgent need to sort of address intent and special interest influencing journalism and storytelling and the dissemination of both around the world, right? Yeah. I mean, I worked for the BBC, which is the world's biggest broadcaster. And part of the reason... Now, I have to say this carefully because I worked with amazing people and, you know, highly ethical and, and amazing people. But, I mean, there, there's a very specific reason why the stories you hear about Africa on major platforms around the world mm. are the way they are. And it isn't just because they sell newspapers or they, they, mm-hmm. they attract mm-hmm. clicks. I understand. There are greater agendas at play. And so there's there's definitely this question of, okay, if you're going to be part of this, there's what works, but then there's, there's typically what doesn't work so well, which is, um, I mean, it took, it took a blockchain company like Cello for us to land our first journalism grant or education sort Amazing. of media grant, yeah. right? Which we should talk about more because I, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's so it, that says something, right? It says something because the, the, it took that level of alignment in sort of democratized potential <laughs> for us to land our first twenty-five grand in seven years of applying for ver- for various grant funds and being part of accelerator programs. And, That's crazy. And being tipped. I mean, we were always. Like I'd get, I'd get these, 
I get people like in different parts of the world going, oh, these guys are talking about you, dude. You're part in someone's deck at this such and such conference or whatever. And we were like, oh, that's fantastic. We applied for a grant from there. We never get the money. <laughs> never get the money because we're just not brand safe. We're not, you know, we're just, we'll never be the brand that gets the money and then follows them around the world, like telling the world how great they are because they yeah. get us the money. Like we'll never yeah. be that brand. And so they're like, once that penny drops, like we just not people they want to play with anymore. Yeah. And so that's when you realize that look, you know, you know, and was, that's why I'm saying kudos to you because you're doing it in an industry I feel you could get away you could argue you don't have to, like you don't have to do things the way you're doing uh, and care as much about like who gets to advertise and you know and the nature of it and, and like keeping it the, the, these are, but yeah. also it's inherent to the blockchain space you're in where culturally these are norms in journalism like being the insider owning the story having the scoop privileged access do you get what i'm saying like holding certain yeah. stories back yeah. and certain yeah. secrets back from like for various interests and doing this as a favor and do, that's part, that's everyday life in in it's normalized um beneath the veneer of all this you know, journalism is this, you know, career of, of integrity. But underneath it, and I've been there, it's it's all this other stuff that you actually do have to solve for because it's poisonous. And if you want things to be done in a way that will will benefit society, you're going to have to solve for that. It's not going to be, it's not just going to be, it's not just going to happen because your editor says we're going to be ethical. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's going to be like, oh, how do you make sure then, you know, the guy who owns the place isn't going to stop yeah. the story when it comes yeah. to the grants? How are you going to solve for it when, you know, this sponsor who spent millions of dollars, it, it, you know, keeps us from from talking when you know there's a scandal in their company? How are you going to solve for those things? And and then also in in typical media organizations, to be fair to these amazing hardworking journalists who work there, there's also they're so far removed from the economic interests of those or large organizations that however hard they work to be integrous sometimes is undermined by the ownership structures and, mm. the, and the lack of, you know, proper. So I, I'm coming from a world where I've been deep fried in these issues. Right. In a it's way. It's different. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of different. And also... Yeah. I think what's also different with you and 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 what's refreshing with you and just listening to how you're trying to solve for integrity in your space is that you came out of the gate and my sense is you you're part of a different generation. I don't know how much younger you are than me, but I think you're part of a generation where aspirationally like the you know young younger millennials and Gen Z like you y'all are on to a sense of like we want to do better than where I'm kind of an older millennial and I'm I'm probably closer to, you know, I'm a millennial by the, the skin of my teeth and I'm a sure. little more institutionalized than, than most people. So I had to sort of ex like see this firsthand and realize how I was even part of the problem before it yeah. hit me in the face, yeah. before I was willing to go, hey, you know, yeah. whereas, you know, and, and th that's also what I learned from Andrew. Um, I think he was on to a lot of the the stuff in a way you know from an american base being based in dc um for a lot of his time as a podcaster he had a front row seat to the interplay between power and and media and um i had the african experience and media and power and how that you know the african stories often hijacked by big media organizations right, right. so yeah, I know I'm, I'm kind of going on for a bit. Here, no, but. no, this makes a lot of sense because, again, it all ties back into like the corruption of, of different business models that play with media in Africa and how social tokens or crypto in general aims to solve it, right? Okay, Mint is one example, uh, yeah. making all payments, all transactions from sponsors on chain so users and, and listeners can see what exactly is happening underneath the hood. You're approaching it from the point of view of like, okay, let's approach social tokens. Let's try to remove the middleman and go straight to the community and the people who love and adore African tech roundup, crowdfund from them, get them involved, uh, and, and have them actually participate in the future success of what this media platform can become. Super unique, super original, and actually quite intuitive to, to what's actually happening in the media space in Africa, from what I'm understanding. These business models are corrupt, 
crypto is kind of that step forward of trying to solve it and trying to introduce new light into the image. There's a lot of experimentation, though. There's a lot of education required. My next question to you is like, how are you thinking about that? Like, obviously, you guys have a program in place that you're trying to kind of like create token based uh, engagement, token and ba- token based listenership. But with kind of implementing something like that comes a lot of education. And I think it's something that a lot of people have a hard time getting across to their audience because it's so new, because it's so fresh, and it can be quite intimidating to jump in. How have you kind of tackled that? How are you educating your audience to implement these token-based listenership engagement programs that you're kind of uh, experimenting with? So first inherent to our our reboot, which um, so in June this, in June, 2021, uh, which is earlier this year, um, we came back from a year long hiatus, which was, you know, my co-founder Musa uh, um, was very kind to just allow me to sort of figure myself out um, and figure out what, you know, what we were going to bring back when we did decide to come back. And what we came back with was, <laughs> was an educational premise Um and so our, our our flagship in the past was the African Tech Roundup flagship podcast, which was uh, largely me and sometimes you know a, a co-host like you know my co my co-founder Musa and, and other co-hosts um, in the past. Um, but it was mostly it, it it was it was a talking heads format that did grapple with like some of the you know the leading uh, you know the sort of most top of mind. Uh, things that were happening in the ecosystem and sort of breaking those down and having a guest to like unpack, you know, a, a, a less explored topic and that sort of thing. Um, and then there were interviews and stuff. But what I realized, you know, what, what I was inspired by was Quora. Um, and the, 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 the normalization that something like Quora, Quora has brought to, you know, challenging someone who knows a lot about something to place it upon themselves to share with the ecosystem. Now, inherent to this process, there's a lot of people who have now like literally turned this into a thought leadership exercise and literally just constantly try and position themselves as the answer to to any given question. But I think by and large, the vibe is, hey, if I've experienced this thing that I think another 100 people, even 10 people, sometimes 1,000 people have also gone through, let me ask this question and answer it and put it out in the world. Um, to the benefit of everybody. And Cora has got the system that sort of uh, allows village credit to accrue, you know, positively towards people who do this uh, and do this really, really well. And it also helps people discover the stuff um, through an upvoting process, et cetera. I don't know why I'm explaining Cora to your audience because <laughs> that's, that's really stupid. But, <laughs> but, I'm just but it makes sense. It ties how- together. It kind of ties together. So, um, so I'm looking at this right alongside everything I'm starting to learn about crypto and everything, and I'm thinking one of the problems of how we were doing this before is we made it we made ourselves so necessary. We made people wait often, you know, up you know up to a month sometimes at a time to hear from us and what we would distill, and we took great pride in sort of owning this agenda setting mandate and. And 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 basically, I took great pride in like letting people know what was important to know when we were ready for them to know it was important to know whatever right. So it was this weird. So there was this big flex. This was all about, but it meant that there were thirty other days in the feed like nothing was happening, and we called dibs on those thirty days, and we saw it, it was more beneficial in our minds to have those days be dormant than to put out stuff that wasn't us like advancing our thought leadership in the space, right? And I know this sounds really self-centered and of course there was a lot more heart to it than that. And of course we cared and we sure. wanted, it wasn't just about us, but at the heart of it was this, I suppose this, um, this, this, this idea that really didn't account for all the brilliance in our ecosystem. And then it was also counterintuitive. It was also counter to the need we had of this, of the very same ecosystem to support us because we created a situation that made it so that every time I met somebody while we were on hiatus, they were like, oh, bro, like you need to come back because nothing's happening till you do. And I was like, how's that my job to like watch 
like what's the back of our <laughs> ecosystem like how when did that become my job to do that and then i was like oh but that's what i trained them to expect you know and then i was like nah when we come back we we need to crush that nonsense right and so the una jua series is literally a series um of 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 podcasts 15 minutes or less that answer questions about the ecosystem that typically are going unanswered um anywhere on the internet and and it's not you know and so the that is now the flagship premise the premise is we are going to seed into the internet a, a bunch of answers or a bunch of minimum viable responses to to questions that are often asked about tech innovation um uh, you know, Africa's digital transformation that aren't being answered adequately or in this format or at all. Uh, and we're just going to start doing that. And we hope they will inspire even more responses or, you know, rebuttals and, and, and spark debate. And, and before long, they'll start to look and feel like, uh, like a really well nurtured, core question that is just elicited you know thousands of responses and 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 it turns into its own yeah. thing and so th I, i'm sharing this because this this is the mindset we've brought to how i think the ecosystem needs to start to own the responsibility to nurture itself to have an other centered approach to what it means to be part of this community and care about it and do business here and and to tell news about it and create stories and tell stories about it and answer questions and ask questions about it. Like this shouldn't be a question of which questions Andile thinks are worth answering today and and which issues does Andile think are worthy of like turning into a podcast tomorrow. This yeah. is this should be a much broader premise of all of us learning and growing together, you know, learning and growing in public together. Sure. And so so that's the the general premise. So now the you know when you think about the social token and 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 who should be able to earn it and why it's within the context of those exchanges you know are you contributing to this to these processes either by consuming consciously i.e like taking in really good stuff and sharing it with other people can we prove you've listened um, and reward you for that can we reward you for sharing it with someone else um can we reward you for contributing a great theme or question that ends up you know in into a podcast episode can we can we can we thank you for the time you spend you know volunteering for the organization in some fashion or you know bringing your insight as a as a as, as someone with with you know in the trenches or who, who mm -hmm. as an expert in the space how how do we turn all these positive things we want to to see normalized in our ecosystem how do we how do we t create a sensibility of you know accountability but also um, a reward system that that you know is this very organic thank you for taking part that's the be that's the spirit behind yeah. the social token and those are the things we're looking to 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 find smart ways to reward and so that's what we started with basic things like you know easter eggs hidden in our content you know you answer the you answer a question you know send us um you know uh send us the answer to that question reward you with token and things like that and, and you, can and you so, automate yeah. that process is that process automated so we're working with social stack to right. to okay to uh, to get it done but no it's not automated i'm afraid it's actually i mean it's it's as it, it's in some respects uh as clumsy as it sounds i mean i, I don't want to sort of um scoop some of the things social stacks is working on to 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 like get this really mm. slick because there's really some cool stuff um currently in beta that uh that i can't talk about right now but i mean no for the moment it is as it is as clumsy as you might expect. It's a, it's a Google form. You fill out, we ping us, and you send us your sort of, Got it. you know, your silo address, and then we reward you. And it's like it's a kind of, you know, your social stack. Uh, so so it's so that's right super, now, that's super I mean, nowhere near the ideal. Yeah, okay. It's so the ideal. this is how I've been doing it on Mint because I also try to implement like a, a proof of participation type of uh, element. Ah, we call it proof of play. We call it proof of play. 
Okay, there you go. Proof of play, proof of participation, proof, 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 whatever. Okay. All the big P's, okay? Um, yeah. The way I do it, okay? And if anybody that's listening that also has a podcast or also has some type of content channel has found a better way, hit us up. I'm actually super curious. But the way I've been doing it is I have a landing page, okay, um, called adamlevy.io forward slash season dash three dash poop, I think. I don't know exactly what the URL is, okay? But the point right. is, is like, I have people submit their first name, last name, email, Twitter handle, stuff like that. So I can like kind of like create a, a, some type of like community, right? Written that I can see. Because the thing that like I don't like is like I push this content out there on audio and also on video. Like I have no way of kind of seeing who's listening. They give me data. They give me metrics. They let me know yeah. who's male, who's female, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't have an email. I don't have an right. address. I don't have anything right. that I can follow up with. So I basically issue po-ops. Uh, proof of attendance protocol. It's basically like a free NFT, essentially, that allows people um, to basically prove that they participate in. And at the end of the season, I send out a mass email through Mail Merge, and I send everybody a link to claim a POAP. And I basically do this for people who've submitted their email in the newsletter, who open the newsletter, who've consistently engaged in the Discord community, um, and have kind of like proven that they've participated, essentially. Um, and there's different forms of participation, but again. Similar to what you guys are doing, which is super cool because it's like you're verifying uh, participation. Yeah. It's like it, like it, it also side tangent. You're seeing a lot of music products in crypto now introduce this level of fandom that allows people to prove that they've listened to an artist prior to them ex exploding. So wow. imagine if you could be on SoundCloud and basically like I was able to listen. I was in Juice World's top 100 listeners right. prior to Juice World becoming Juice World, and I can wow. like flex that right so it's like the same concept it's like okay if you're listening to something mint hopefully one day is going to be this big bad podcast and media outlet that is going to be of a resource to creators and in crypto individuals alike and people who kind of like participate early on can prove that you're taking the same approach yeah so here's my question to you though how yeah. are people taking to that like because i think the challenge is is hack is hacking is like hacking habits you know how do you how do you turn this into something people yeah like how do you make this part of people's lives in a way that isn't an interruption to it you know yeah, what are you finding as far as that's concerned so how do you apply this as people's lives without being an interruption the beauty behind pull ops it's already ingrained in crypto culture people love collecting free nfts these moments that kind of prove that you participated or you, or you were at a location. So, for example, you go to an event, you prove that you were there physically, the organizers hand you a POAP that goes to your address, you can prove you were at that event. You come to Mint, you join the Discord, you join the newsletter, you're automatically qual qualified for a POAP. You've joined, you've entered, you've mm. taken that step. These are things, POAPs are already things that have already naturally ingrained in like crypto culture. So it actually just like, it just follows them along their journey. You know, it's nothing like new that they have to do or anything like that. And to be honest, and I've talked about this very publicly on the podcast is like, it has been the best growth hack to kind of bootstrap uh, a, a newsletter in a crypto community and in an audience uh, and mm. get like sort of, I've gotten thousands upon thousands of registrations, you know, and submissions for these po-ops as proof of participation because people... The assumption is essentially is like, and you've seen this with like uh, communities like Bankless, shout out to Bankless, they kill it. Uh, and other communities that if they have a database of your addresses, then if there is some type of token event or NFT event, the people who have participated early on will get priority in airdrops. That's kind of like the mentality. Okay. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And whether or not that's going to happen with Mint is not the point. Rather, it's kind of like ingraining and sucking people into the process and having them participate and contribute and being able to celebrate that participation by giving something. So it's a very like you listen, I give you kind of relationship that I love that I'm trying to cultivate, you know? So fascinating, man. So now I'm thinking, you know, at what point does a social token make sense for you um, yeah. in the context of what you're building? You know, I've been thinking about uh, Levy coin, for example. Okay. Hmm. Um, and I personally haven't found the right model to do it yet. Now, mm. 
So, okay, so I recorded an episode with uh, uh, Shenanigans, okay, which is basically a platform uh, that creates social tokens for athletes, okay, a whole different class of, of creators. And me and I think uh, me and Victor, we were kind of like going back and forth and we we're like, wait, there's this actually a new interesting model that has yet to be explored that I'm like, I may or may not be exploring, okay, um, that uh, rather than minting a certain amount of tokens off the bat, like 10 million tokens, like or a thousand tokens, a million off, like what a lot of people are doing, yeah. what if you could actually print and mint tokens based off your contribution to your community, for example? Every Tuesday and Thursday, I publish an episode of the podcast. What if there was a smart contract that would basically be able to verify the RSS feed and see that I've contributed and pushed out an episode and accordingly print and mint tokens and airdrop it and distribute it to me and like pay me, right? And also like distribute it to the community who've listened. So that way, my content and my incentives are aligned with publishing and con contribution rather than minting a bunch of tokens right and ahead and keeping them in a multi-sig in a treasury what if we could just do them off the bat but based off participation you know what i mean mm -hmm. now there's a few mm -hmm. issues with that okay how do you kind of like mitigate inflation because this would be a token supply that's uncapped it'll be infinite yeah i was gonna say i mean you know so you'd, you'd, have, to like, have, you'd <laughs> have to have some no you'd have to have some event it would qualify as burning tokens so let's say if i publish on tuesday and thursday Okay, then the days that I don't publish, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, things get burned because I'm not actively giving and contributing. That way you kind of mitigate infl inflation. But this is something that mm. it's like if you talk about a creator coin, okay, these mm -hmm. contracts, they need to extend way beyond 10 million because 10 million is just an arbitrary number. Creators, they grow and they, 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 they live to, to 80, 75 years old. How do you stay along that that journey, right? And what does that look like from a tokenomics point of view? And I don't know, like I like this model of being able to give as you grow, right? Being aligned yeah. with your community and minting and printing and distributing. The more you contribute, the more you give, the more value you create. I thought that was a super cool model. Is that you trying to navigate away from the sense that when you dictate a, a finite, you know, supply upfront, you're essentially tying your community into a form of enrichment for you that might not necessarily be linked to output? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't so want you want to be able to earn it but... as they as things grow. Correct. Right. So who knows? Mint may, Mint may even produce products in the future, right? Like software products for creators, mm. right? How can I kind of capture that value as an individual and as a brand, right? Beyond having like a limited token supply, mm. you know? And what, and again, it comes back to like, so I'm motivated for multiple reasons. One, my incentives are aligned. So if I don't contribute, I don't get. If I contribute, I get. And so does everybody else. So I like that. Okay. Uh, I also like the idea that this hasn't really been like messed around with 100%. It could be a really interesting model uh, that people kind of engage with in the future. Like I haven't seen someone kind of do an infinite token supply in Mint as you go. One thing that made a lot of sense and going back to shenanigans, Victor is like, this works really well for athletes and could work really well because an athlete, an athlete's career kind of lasts two, yeah. three, five years, right? What happens after that? You know, like how do they build brand? How do they build community? How do they build fan bases, et cetera, fandom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you only basically create a coin for an athlete during his two to three to five year period, what happens when they kind of graduate? What happens to that coin? What happens to that community? You know, and so I don't know. These are things I've like been experimenting. It's a very like early, early concept that I haven't seen implemented, but I just like it to summarize everything because incentives are aligned for me as are a creator aligned. in my community what needs to be so kind of worked out is that burning mechanism how do you mitigate inflation down the line so my question then in the context of you know how quickly things move uh i mean what are you giving yourself like two three years what's the opportunity cost of not getting in now what do you mean one more time i mean if you I don't know how fast you're moving on trying to del to to work on this idea or this this model you're working on, um, but th there's a sense I get that for every year 
let's call it not even a year is a long time. For every six months, you wait to to sort of position your brand to capture value or to sort of build and, and, and groom value in this way. I feel like you 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 run the risk of of coming in with like hundreds of thousands of people who are like l- late to the party on it and and then look a little more opportunistic and and perhaps less organic about it mm. where I mean you're early now and I think part of we're all early in a sense um and so maybe that that's I, I'm not, this is me sort of projecting Right, I I, mm, I ask myself mm. why now? Like, why would we do the so the token now? Um, why wouldn't we do other things first as a as a double dabble towards, at some point, sort of launching it when I don't know social token economy infrastructure plays mature, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, why subject ourselves to to all this to all the these platforms forming around us as we do what we're trying to do? Why not wait until everything's formed? You know. Well, um, I think there's the beauty of being an early adopter. And by being an early adopter, uh, if done right, you deem a lot of the early success and you capture a lot of the value. We saw this really, really well with the NFT wave. A lot of the Instagram and corporate designers that kind of were very, very talented had thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of followers on Instagram because they were just constantly post content, pivoted into NFT, started selling their work in understanding what ownership meant on chain. And now they're selling work in Christie's and Sotheby's and the auction houses. The list goes on and on and on, right? Social tokens yeah. haven't had their moment just yet. We've seen iconic players that have kind of like brought light to social tokens and creator coins. We're seeing platforms and in, in organizations that are building tech like Social Stack, like Coinvise, like Rally. The list goes on and on and on trying to kind of like bring this vision and this reality to life because there is a lot of value from it, but they haven't had their moment yet. I think starting early, the why now portion is because why not? That's how I think about it. Why not start now? Like what what are the risks? Inherently, I don't think there are that many risks. If anything, I think it would actually like all the creators that are kind of dabbling with crypto and all the, all the creators that are dabbling with social tokens, NFTs, they're positioning themselves just adopting that mentality of being early adopters, testing, throwing shit at the fan, trying to see what works, that level of mentality, whether it's going to be social tokens, NFTs, whatever is going to come in the future is going to position them up for success down the line. Yeah. So I think there's yeah. there's many other factors that come into place. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think, and I suppose good, like, you're, you're also them. quite evolved. You're also quite evolved as a, um, even in the way you think about NFTs and how you're using them. I mean, it's quite clear that you're thinking about it as much more than just a, an opportunity to capture value or ride the hype. Um, so in a sense, you are, you are approaching that practice with, you're approaching NFT with like some of the sensibilities we are approaching social tokenry with mm. in, in a way. Mm. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a kinship there that, um, you know, listening to you is actually quite interesting um, to observe and to learn from, man. Really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thank you. You know, an- another thing is like when it comes to social tokens, I'll say this again, they haven't had their moment yet. And a lot of what Mint aims to do is provide that public roadmap from public mm-hmm. being like the transparency of that ENS domain that tracks all of the sponsorships yeah. to transparency of how to content from things that kind of like we start as doing audio that then get transcribed to video that then gets transcribed to the blog and then the newsletter and creating multiple destinations of like how to guides for how creators can get started using crypto to own their audience and build community, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we're super, super early on that concept. People are still used to renting. People rent their audiences off these big platforms. People rent uh, 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 their followers, their fan base, their likes. They rent. Everything lives on a platform that they do not own. I'm trying to create this message and get people to wake up of like, there's value in owning and not even that there's value in co-owning and building community around those, those, those values. Right. And mm. by launching NFTs, by launching social tokens, opening up a discord, a telegram, taking your audience from web two into web three. Now you have a direct concrete funnel, of direct line of communication to work with them, to build with them, to grow with them. Something that you don't own on web two mm. that you now own in web three, right? Because you can get mm. shadow banned, you can get discontinued, 
you can do all like Spotify can remove your podcast. Something that I'm trying to Absolutely. discover. I was like, how do I upload this stuff to IPFS? There's a problem. I can't really upload like really, really long files on there yet. Not even wow. that. There aren't products, apps, and platforms that allow people to consume this content. So it's still like that just shows you how early we super are. Early, yeah. Think, We're right? Super early. Super, oh, wow. Super we need early. these guys so much. We right? need these major platforms far too much. Yeah. So yeah, my, so much my, growth. Yeah, yeah. My my head is like I'm always thinking like, okay, you're doing it in a super creative way. You're trying to like you're trying to create more transparency when it comes to media on Africa and, and as use that as an example for other other areas that kind of face same issues and had a level of influence, change the narrative around tech startups and do it in a way where people can kind of co-own, be involved and join along the process now through yeah. a, a new means, AKA crypto, AKA social tokens. And I think it's really cool how creators like you are kind of tinkering around with these models because it's people like us. And I'm not even going to talk about myself, people like you. Okay. People like other people that have had the podcast, it's up to them to do the education. There's not going to be a big entity that comes into place and sets global education guidelines. It's all it's all through community. It's all through people yeah. like these types of conversations. It's organic. It's all organic, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's just like my two cents. The and uh, you know, great segue to to the shameless plug I'm about to make about, you know, what we're doing with all this grant funds, all this grant money we got from Cello. Well, yeah. All, all thousands of it. It's not like that much. Because that, that was going to be my next question. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So you did get grant money over the last few yeah. years. You've been having a hard time getting grant money. You tapped into crypto, got a grant. You're building towards this vision of equitable media, right? And doing yeah. it along the yeah. way where community can co own and be a part of that process. What yeah. is that grant going to be used for? Uh, yeah. Why Cello? Like, walk me through that. So our social tokens minted on Cello. Uh, why Cello? Because we thought long and hard about all kinds of things. Um, you know, the pros and pitfalls of this whole new uh, sort of blockchain wave. And I mean, things like the environmental impact can't be ignored. Things like um, the inherent, uh, the inherent sort of. Uh, um, non-inclusiveness of certain blockchains just you know sheer cost of gas prices on ethereum for example uh um yeah so there's just such a it's, it's such a loaded uh loaded issue for for a media entity that's building for uh, and on the african continent and and so cello when you research its credentials and um the technicalities of the, like the you know the the, the the blockchain itself you know or you know it's 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 mobile it's mobile forward sensibilities and um it's it, it, the the intentionality around being designed for for adoption or mass adoption in in developing markets these are all things that we thought thought about and i know they're not unique in this in this instance but they've certainly been among the first and perhaps most well executed um projects you know leaning into these ideals and so that's why cello as a place to mint our social token and as a logical place to go asking for support to to educate people on on blockchain tech in, in general on the uh, quote unquote africa blockchain opportunity uh, blockchain Africa opportunity. Shout out to you, uh, Michael Kimani, who who's sort of coining that term. This idea of there's a unique sort of version of what blockchain can do and how and why and and a unique utility and usefulness um, that is specific to 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 various African markets in their context. And so, I think there's just so much to learn. You touched on Web three and and um, you know. There's the overused term, the fourth industrial revolution, which is just so thoroughly overused and almost means nothing on the African continent because um, it's a projected term that, you know, that that hasn't meant much. And here's an opportunity for us to have something and be a part of, genuinely part of something that isn't just an intellectual notion. Um, and so we're really given to helping people understand these things uh 
in an accessible manner, in a first person manner. So what are we using the money for? Well, it's straight up an education project. You know, it's, we're going to be doing more of these in a Jewish short form, you know, podcast mini series, you know, answering questions that we think, uh, where we hear people in the streets asking about, you know, what's, what's this whole blockchain thing about, you know, how do you get involved? You know, what's the investment opportunity that's unique to this, to the, the African continent? Um, uh, we're going to have long form podcast conversations as well. We're going to take them to other platforms where people can convene and sort of have more interactive conversations around them. We're going to commission some long form writing and um, look to syndicate that sort of thing, translate that into a number of different African languages. That's what we're doing with this. Um, we want people to be a part of what's going on in a way that in the past we would have just sort of. Um, seen this as an opportunity to sort of double down on our place in the ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Whereas now we want everyone to like, we literally want this to be a village activity. Like this is lit. If, if that, if, if what we're up to doesn't turn into a village activity into some, if it's, if it stays something they're doing over there, messing around in, in their little sort of sand pit over there, then, then we failed. And so yeah. that's the grand, that's the grand plan. And um, thank you, Cello. And, and shout out to anybody who's listening to this and and thinks they need to get involved. You probably should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it pays to be an early adopter, uh, whether through airdrops or through value or through knowledge accumulated or through 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 failing and learning. Um, I'm super excited for you. I, I'm really thrilled to kind of like stay along your journey and see the success of the community and the lessons learned. And we should definitely do this again in like six months to a year and see what the progress has been. But uh, thank you so much be for being on. I think it's a great place to end off. Where can we thank find you. you? Where can we learn more about you? Where can we stay in touch? Give me give me the spiel. All right. Well, africantechroundup.com. That is the mothership. Uh, you'll find us on, on Twitter at African Roundup. You'll find us on uh, Facebook, facebook.com forward slash African uh, Tech Roundup. Uh, we are on Instagram also as African as at African Roundup. Hey, I mean, just Google African Tech in most in most places in the world. We will organically rank top three. Um, so if that's too, if everything else right. is too hard to remember, just that's the flex. That's what we do. That would be like that's the mic drop. We'd be like, hey, just just Google African Tech. You'll find us. You know. Um, and then of course, personally, uh, you know, I'm. I love to interact on 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 LinkedIn and Twitter. So find your boy. I'm my name and surname backwards. Masugu Andile, M A S U K U, Andile A N D I L E. That's at Masugu Andile on Twitter, and just Google Andile Masugu on uh, or search Andile Masugu on LinkedIn. You should find Amazing. me quite really. Andile, thank you so so much, man. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Such a, a deep wealth of knowledge. Uh, we'll do this again soon. Thanks. I've learned a lot. This has been fantastic. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Adam, for having me you on. You got it.